I record on. Okay. So I have gone through some of the bridging form comments that's come back to me. And I want to really appreciate all of you disclosing your personal struggles in the risk log. And it gives me a sense of all the things that's going on outside this room, this moment right now. And it's not easy. <laughs> full of admiration of all the things that we juggle. And I get a sense that there's an indirect ask to use this space to restore our spirit and humanity when it's worn away by the day-to-day -day struggles that we go through. So when I said in my life story last week that I felt judged by what I went through by some of my peers and supervisors, that's a really interesting moment because that's when contingencies appear to me. I realized that there was this weight of expectation to be able to handle all of life's conditions, be this saintly human being that gives unlimited amount of care. And then to deviate from this, I was met with punishment um, of shame. So that was shocking for me because I thought I belonged to a compassionate, caring community <laughs> of people, but actually that wasn't the case. Um, so I hear some of this judgment that, that came up in the bridging form that, you know, the pressure you put on yourself, you're all juggling so much, giving so much, yet there's this kind of undercurrent of, oh, it's not enough, it's not enough. Um, and some of you don't even feel like you're giving enough here in this group, which, in, which is incredible, you know, and some of you fed back that you want to understand the clinical aspects and goals in what we're doing. So level one is to teach you to see the contingencies starting with what are the factors pulling your strings, basically, is to wake you up, to pull off the blinders, and to be able to see each other's contingencies. Then you can also see your clients, right? That's fundamental. And it's being able to see what the heart feels but with your consciousness. And once you can see all these invisible threads pulling at us, this will make you a more effective therapist. You'll be able to formulate so much better. And not only that, you'll be able to plan interventions and influence your clients towards behavioral change with much more accuracy. Okay. So, but in a way, it's quite nuanced because you are experiencing this. So you're going to have to dive deep. And it's like some people are saying, well, why, why are we bringing our own personal stuff? This is like slightly weird. And most of us and come from different cultures. We have different repertoires. And we have, we're bound to have some of our behavioral repertoires punished, okay? So we become more limited as human beings. And there's some, some parts of us that we struggle to express. So learning to express genuine care in your reinforcements and then receive them are a way for these closed off or broken parts to heal and be integrated. Especially when you ex expect these behavior to be punished. Okay? And this is how clients come to us. There's bits of them that's closed off and being punished. And we are trying to put them together. We're trying to integrate all of these parts. So that's the function of a lot of these exercises. Okay. Now, I want you to observe. Oh, let me just let somebody in. It's multitasking. So I want you to observe on different levels what's happening here. So you kind of have to have a me metacognition. So there's the part of you that's experiencing the exercise. And there's also part of you that has to watch as a clinician and learn from your experience. So it's not easy. Okay, so the observer part, I want you to see, okay, can you notice how I set up the contingency and the context? Even now, as I'm speaking to you, I'm priming you. How, what context am I setting up? And two, I want you to observe, how does each exercise evoke aspects of you that's hidden or punished? Okay, and that's rule two. Rule, rule two. And then observe what worked for you. When somebody's evoking you, when somebody's um, reinforcing you, it, did it work? Right, so rule three is reinforcement. And did it land on you? And when you are evoking and reinforcing somebody, is that working? That's rule four, therapist impact. Okay, so noticing your impact on another person. And of course, when you go off and you think through what happened today, 
and really write down your reflections and your bridging form and your wrist logs. That's basically practicing rule five. You're taking away verbal instructions of your experience outside into a day-to-day -day world. Okay, so just throwing it out there and then it will wash over you. Right, so to get a start, because timing is tight, um, I'm going to start us with a poem and some of you, not most of you will probably be familiar with it, but I, it just really resonated with me when I was reading um, your bridging form feedbacks. So just allow yourself to be as comfortable as you need to be while I find the poem, here it is. And let yourself settle and feel your body in your own space. Taking a breath and feeling your feet maybe on the ground, your bum on the chair. And just sense and hear that you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun, the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. Cause to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So allow yourself to take a breath and maybe notice what these words evoke for you. And can I just ask for very short comments from anybody who want to share that? Or you can also type in the chat. I like the, uh, the concept of even if you're berating yourself, even if you like got yourself in a sackcloth and you're beating yourself for repentance, the world is still <laughs> revolving and all of these wonderful things are still happening and your suffering is not changing any of that. Your suffering is your weight to carry. So for whose benefit are you doing it? That's why I was kind of interpreting it. And it worked for me thinking of it that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's really beautifully noticed. And we're only one little part of the bigger, beautiful world. Okay, any other impressions? I quite like the um, invitation, you don't have to be good. And then I found myself really distracted because I was thinking, oh, I recognise this poet, I think he's an Irish poet. And then I was distracted again, I was thinking, I wonder what was going on in Ireland at the time. And I thought, oh, I know this. So I was actually found myself paradoxically actually beating myself up. You should have remembered this because it was given to you as a kind of, also I'm able to hear the invitation. Sorry, your, your connection is a little bit, um, you keep breaking up, so. Okay. Right. Any other yeah. comments? Sorry. Well, we've kind of we've lost you there. All right. So, in the interest of time, and one thing that you all said is it would be nice to have more interaction. Um, absolutely. Um, I would like. Oh, somebody's still talking. Sorry. 
I would like to be able to randomly assign people to breakout rooms, but um, it, technology is not being very cooperative. I don't know whether I can, can I assign um, host to you, um, James, is that okay? Then maybe it might allow you to create um, breakout rooms for me. You can try, but like, as I've mentioned in the chat, I'm in another country using ah, phone okay. data. So okay. relying on me might not be the best time today. Any other day would be grand. <laughs> I'm just warning you. Kelsey, can I assign you host? Then maybe you can do random room because it won't let me. Try it. Okay, give it a go. Make host. Make, okay, okay. Uh, wait one sec, you just disappeared on me. All right. Tian? Yes. Do you know that you can um, create um, breakup rooms with names and we can I put did ourselves that. inside? Yeah, I did that. <laughs> but okay, so you can actually put yourself inside. Okay. No, I have reassigned, but anyway, this is this is random. So I just want random pairing, if you can do that, Kelsey. Um, giving it a try. And in the meantime, while well, Kelsey's trying, any other comments while we're here? So feedback about Worst that. case scenario, if you're having difficulty breaking this into room and you just want volunteers to model the risk log or their attempt at itself, I'm happy to share with the whole group if needs be. That's okay. Just as an option. Thank you, James. Okay. So, which is a really good idea. So, well, we try to do that, or maybe not. Can two people, not James, because I know you, can two people maybe um, be ready to do the risk log um, with us? Can I pick on two people? Okay, I'm going to pick on two people. Um, I can see Yana in front of me. Yana, would you mind sharing sharing your risk uh, your sorry your risk log? Maybe just um, one. Yeah, just okay. let me uh, quickly search for it. <laughs> um, maybe another one goes first, and then I. Okay, who's got their risk log at hand that they're willing to speak up and share? And bear in mind, CRB two would be allowing yourself to speak in the group. I'm willing to share. Thank you, Sarah. So why don't you go ahead and just share one aspect of the risk log and, um, and I will have somebody can just come and give you a reinforcement. Okay. Um, one thing that I included on my risk log was um, a moment when I was driving with a friend and um, she mentioned that she was feeling car sick and I can be kind of, um, I don't have like a reputation as a very good driver. And sometimes I can feel like defensive when a passenger is, um, I don't know, warning me of stoplights ahead or, or giving me feedback about my driving. Um, but I asked her for feedback about how I could drive in a way to make her feel more comfortable, which felt a little bit in hindsight, like a risk because I was maybe admitting that I might have some responsibility and her not feeling well and um, opening myself up to receive like feedback or correction. So that was one example. Okay, um, Andrew, are you willing to offer any feedback? to Sarah. Oh, you're on mute, Andrew. There we go, I'm back. Yeah, so I mean, I, I noticed with uh, Sarah, because we're in the same Apple uh, pod um, group. Okay. So I, she was sharing already with her story. And, I, and to be honest, I was driving today for two hours to pick my mum. And I remembered you, you know, the way that you were able to just put someone else first when it's very stressy driving for you to just stop and you've done a trigger and you've stopped yourself. And I think that was great. The way that you're able to look for someone else first, you know, when your friend's not feeling well. And I did the same thing on my mum today. 
that my driving could be a little bit crazy on the motorway. <laughs> and I just had your picture today. So I, that impacted me a lot and made me to drive carefully and tell my mom I would go no fighting, no shouting at crazy drivers. And it makes a difference. It's a nice trigger uh, to look out for others. So thank you, Sarah, for your example. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. No luck, Kelsey. Oh. Well, I, I believe I've had some luck. Um, it looks like we yeah. have, just so you know, I have to recreate the rooms. Oh, no. Okay. But, but it doesn't look like anybody's assigned to the pods anyway. Yeah, I did do that. I don't know why it's not showing up. But anyway, let's just randomly assign. And then um, literally really uh, short, sharp. So share your risk log, one minute feedback, and then we're back. Okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try and do it. Okay. Are you getting, is anybody getting an invite to join a room? Oh, we're disappearing. <laughs> oh, is it just me and you left? Yes, I don't know how I sh we should be in rooms, Tian. How do we put ourselves in a room? I, I we're in a room together then. Oh, uh, uh, what are you drawing, Yasmin? Yasmin seems to be on her own, room 12. Room 12. Okay, and room 11, it looks yeah. like Stephen's by himself. Okay. So I'll go to 12. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Not the helicopter. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to get your laptop. So, yeah. Right, so how about you share your room? Okay, yeah. Uh, let me just go. <laughs> so maybe one highlight that you can remember. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think you've read yeah. everything I've said um, that I've shared so far. So I'll just pick out something different. Okay. It was, the noise has gone. That's really good. Something goes, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I get so um broke up with my girlfriend about a year ago and um her parents meant a lot to me mm. uh, especially her dad he was quite a role model for me and i, I didn't really realize how much he'd influenced me yeah um, and it so it's been a long time since i've seen and spoke to them and he's been in my dreams a lot recently and uh, i've had moments of feeling really joyful and grateful and he's always come to mind mm -hmm. um, and i felt and he's also um, but a terminal diagnosis of cancer. So I felt like it'd be good to reach out to her to see if I could, uh, if we could all meet together and see your parents. I felt like it'd be a meaningful thing to do. Yeah. Um, so, but it felt like a risk reaching out to her because we've only kind of spoken a handful of times since we broke up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how was it when you reached? It was, she, uh, she said she wouldn't feel comfortable with us all meeting together, which was a shame. Mm. Uh, did, I'd, been, I'd been following a similar feeling recently of like when I felt the sense of gratitude to tell people and it's always led to meaningful conversations. So I, I followed it again, but this time. Um, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't the time. Well, I, that is a big risk to really go beyond your own personal pain and whatever happened to you your girlfriend to really care about um her, her father did you say and to kind of show that you know this is a little bit this is greater and bigger than whatever happened between us and that tells me you, you know you really connect with people very deeply and it's not easy for you to separate and in a way that kind of reassures me knowing you because <laughs> I feel like you know if I build a genuine relationship with you you're going to be someone who's going to be around for a while and that's kind of that feels kind of reassuring and you know how to hold on to that so thank you for sharing that side of you <laughs> yeah thanks Tim. no worries 
Um, so in terms of my risk, um, it's kind of a weird one because um, I suppose all of this is a risk. It's, it's like putting myself um, in public and displaying and having this attention um, is, is kind of a mixed feeling, mixed bag, because on one hand, I'm doing something I really feel passionate about and I really enjoy. But when I walk away from the whole situation, it's almost, I feel slightly deflated. I feel like, and I haven't put my finger on why. I feel deflated. I feel like disconnected to what I just did. And that initial excitement of actually going into doing it, um, that excitement just isn't there anymore. So I don't know whether, you know, so I'm still a little bit mixed about what's going on because doing this in a way is, is taking a big risk. Um, but whether I feel the emotional reward of that, hmm, yeah, that's still to be seen. <laughs> so I feel something is, you know, a little bit blocked there. Hmm. Yeah, and thanks for sharing. I feel like even sharing that with me is a risk in itself. Um, and but I think I'd like to also feedback how <laughs> engaging I've found the, the course. Um, and it, even from the from the interview, from the get go of the interview, I, I was really um, I wouldn't shut up about it for a while. So. <laughs> Uh, at least on, on my end, I find it very, uh, very engaging, very meaningful. It's made me think a lot. So, um, yeah, I hope that you can find what it is that is making you feel deflated or, or whether it's just a time thing. Um, yeah. yeah, I hope, hope it starts to make a bit more sense for you. Thank you, Steve. But I, again, like maybe it's hearing the impact. So hearing you just say, well, that has been impactful. Um, I think that that's kind of reassuring. So maybe, you know, when you're teaching people, you don't immediately get that impact and get that reinforcement. Um, <laughs> especially online, everybody just feels slightly <laughs> not there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think we will be disappearing now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll see you back in a minute. Yeah, I guess worth the risk. But thanks for the chat. We really nice to speak to you. Okay. Likewise. Oh, so I wasn't kidding when I said that was going to be fast. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was. Thank you, Bree. <laughs> All right. So um, I will keep the teachy bit to minimum. Um, but I do have to refine what a CRB one and two is for, especially for people who d didn't come from FAB, um, because it can be a little bit confusing. Um, so let me share screen and slideshow. All right. So today's theme is. We keep jumping in and out. So today's theme is seeing the invisible, okay? And which pretty much, I guess what I said summed it up is for us to see contingencies that we previously couldn't see. Now, FAP of course lives under the contextual uh, behavioral science and the approach to psychotherapy focuses on context on context and within context, we need to notice contingent responding and con contingencies around us and then respond to these variables. And how we respond to, our, to these variables, um, well, really it's, it, depends, it depends on the function, right? Depends on the outcome. Our response can be very useful or our response can really not really give us the result that we want, okay? So but FAP sort of narrows down a little bit because FAP is um, looking at contingent responding in the context of intimate therapeutic relationship, okay? So we can't say that we are changing our client's life anywhere else because we're actually sitting in a room or somewhere else, but we're interacting with our clients. So that is the context that we are working in and we can't, um, we can't dismiss that. 
So the good thing is that there is good evidence for the use of contingent reinforcement of behavior in session. Because like I think somebody said last week, if we can reinforce a behavior there and then, it just has more strength. The reinforcement has more strength and we can be sure that we're reinforcing the right uh, behavior because if time, any kind of time gets in between, behavior changes and behaviors move on, okay? So in FAP, one of the key uh, processes of change is proposed to be this kind of reinforcement um, relationship that's going on. So CRB, clinically relevant behaviors, are the unit of analysis in FAP. So we're trying to work out when a client is showing us a behavior, uh, what is that about? And what is the function of those behaviors? So in order to reinforce the right one, we kind of have to know everything they're doing, what, what is gonna be helpful for them, okay? So some of you might be familiar with the Fiat Q, some of you not, but as part of that process of trying to narrow down and identify, okay, so what behaviors are helpful or not helpful, right? Because in traditional behavioral science, every analysis is so ideographic and so tailored to the client, it's really hard to teach and it's really hard to learn and really hard to do. And it just feels like anything could be anything, but not really, because at the end of the day, we are looking at a limited context of intimate therapeutic relationship. And not only a therapeutic relationship, we're looking at a context of an intimate relationship. So the FIAT by Glenn Callahan, and I think later on he had another co-author, narrowed it down and basically said, okay, what are the essential um, behaviors that are useful to make an intimate therapeutic relationship or an intimate relationship work, if not any relationship. So he developed um, this, uh, the functional ideographic assessment template system. And this system just identifies five categories, five functional categories um, that seems to encapsulate what a relationship, a good relationship um, can be, all right? So not to go too deeply into the FIAT categories yet, what I just want you to place, FAP is really, um, because it's based on functional analysis, it's really, the, I, I would guess, the start of process-based treatment. It has always been a process-based treatment. And as you know, ACBS is now really hot on process-based therapy and process-based treatments. And even the RFT camp have developed their own process-based treatment. But FAP was kind of there already. Functional analysis was already there. You know, behavioral analysis was already there. That was, you know, the original process-based treatment, okay? So that's where it sort of sits. Now, functional analysis in FAP. So this is kind of what you have to get your head around. So we have the client, we have the therapist. So we have the diet and together you co-create a relationship. So there's already three things in the room, the client, therapist, and the relationship. And the relationship, I, I like to think is like kind of the baby <laughs> that's always there that you create when you come together with somebody. And not only that, you have to hold in your mind um, the proximal verbal community. So who's in the client's um, world now? Who's in your world now as a therapist? Because they all play, have some influence on you. And not only the proximal, so here, here, now, we have to consider social, cultural community. So where do we come from? right? What are the previous influences um, that has affected us? And of course, our learning history within this social, cultural communities or our family, our racial culture, our community, our environment, etc. All right. So that is a lot to hold for a functional therapist. Okay. So any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean proximal verbal community? Okay. Proximal, the proximal just means people that are close to us here now. Right. So it's not going too far into the learning history. It's it's you. You're influencing me now. So you're you're currently my proximal verbal community. <laughs> so verbal community is just Things the words that I use. Yeah, exactly. 
people around you that speak and what you speak will have some influence on me. Okay. So it's what, a, what about body language? Oh, language? that's all right. That's all there. Yeah. So in behavioral science, everything's behavior. Language is behavior. But but there's verbal. I know that's that's it's slicing that's the very I agree. That's the way the behaviorist basically call community because we all swim in language. So without diving too deeply into that, we all swim in language and verbal community is um, even our body language, everything is influenced by language. We can't be out of language, if that makes sense. Okay, but let's not dive too deeply. Just to keep it simple, we are influenced by people who are around us and we're also influenced by our learning history. Okay, so this is, these are the contingencies that you basically have to open up to start seeing. And it's a lot of stuff. Yes. So now therapist. So what does awareness, courage, and love look like? And how do we apply that? So in the room, the therapist, what is awareness for the therapist? It means noticing our sensations, noticing the thoughts, the history of us and how we are impacting this moment. And can we be aware, which show curiosity and tenderness towards whoever is in front of us? And can we be aware of where our impact on our clients, whether we are reinforcing the right behaviors or punishing, or we are actually evoking problem behaviors or helpful ones? Okay, so there's a lot to be aware of for the therapist. So what's courage in the room? Courage is basically being able to be evocative. And even showing kindness, love, compassion can be quite, you know, quite scary for some people, right? It's not their cultural norm. So it's a willingness to step out of comfort zone and to evoke in the service of client growth. Okay, so it has to be in the service of client growth, not because you can get a reaction from people. It can't be done for sport. It can't be done because you enjoy emotional intensity in the room, um, only when it applies to what's helpful for the client. And sometimes it's courageous being honest. Um, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I missed what you, you know, what you just said. Sometimes it's being able to apologize to our clients, and that could be quite hard for some people, right? Um, it's being able to be expressive and vulnerable. And already, some of you are experiencing the difficulty to doing that, even with this group. Love. What does that love look like? Is being attuned to ourselves, being compassionate, always checking in, grounding. Um, are we taking care of ourselves? Are we setting boundaries for our clients? Um, are we acknowledging our own strength and assets? We can't do everything. You know, can we say, that's all right, I can't, I'm, I don't want to see these kind of people. I don't want to see this condition. Can we set limits as well? Okay. And so what does awareness look like for the client in session? Pretty much the same. You know, we're, you're trying to help them notice their own sensations and thoughts. Their CRB ones and twos. Okay. So CRB ones are their problem behaviors? So behaviors that's not getting them what they what's what they need or want, is things that are not working for them. And CRB two are their improvement behaviors or target behaviors that you want to aim for. And what's courage for a client is encouraging them to be honest, to show parts of themselves that's been previously punished, right? Because that's going to be scary, especially vulnerability, and um, and to take the courage to trust you to take the courage to take risks, to pursue their values, dreams, and longings. And what's love? Love is making sure that they can in tune to you too. It's not just about me, me, me for the client. You know, do they notice you? Do, are they reinforcing of you? Because if you're not getting that sense that they can also do this bi-directional um, attunement, then they're probably not doing it to their loved ones around them outside, right? Um, sometimes love is tough love. It means blocking behavior that's not helpful for them and giving them very, um, and then, uh, and then I guess shaping up that self-compassion so they can receive compassionate feedback from people, right? And also the self-love and being able to care about them enough to highlight their own strengths. Okay. So love is very much about self-compassion and work. All right. So so pretty much FAP is a step towards process-based treatment and it allows you to formulate a very individual 
um, client, client uh, formulation. It allows you to see the individual repertoires and it distinguishes, uh, sorry, it discriminates between a problem behavior to the target behavior. So you can reinforce more accurately. And not only that, it tracks, allows you to track contextually the longitudinal development of a person. So you're tracking their behavior change all the time. And when you're shaping up some behavior, like say assertiveness, right? If you want a client to start asking for things, if they start to ask, can I move my session to this time? That's great. The first time they did it, you went, yay, that's brilliant. I'm really glad you're able to speak up. But over time, they start to ask and ask and ask and ask. This behavior has now slipped into CRB1 territory, right? So we also have to look at the behavior in different contexts and whether it's functionally um, workable. So once they learn asking, if they think they can just go and ask for everything and expect that to be a really you know, reinforced, then that won't work either. So do they have the ability to discriminate when to ask, who to ask, what is reasonable? So all of these nuances then need to be shaped up later on. Okay, so it's a bit like growing a child. They grow up and they have different abilities. And, you know, you as a parent, you want to set them sort of the right, um, the right, you want to allow them to grow into the right ability. So they can go up the street when they're 10, but you probably wouldn't let them go up the street when they're five. Okay, so shaping up client behavior is similar to that. And the emergence of phenomenon at different levels of analysis. So this is basically saying you basically have to look at the this dyad, that little circle, client, uh, therapist, the dyad, the immediate reinforcement, and their behavior history. Okay, so it's a lot to think about. This is why it's a lot easier for you to experience to start with, rather than having to swallow all of this. Okay, so. Um, now, part of this um, training is to start introducing FAP to your clients. So to introduce that FAP, you basically kind of have to understand it enough to sell it, to describe, okay, this is what we're going to be doing, right? So you have kind of their, their consent and they know what's happening. And if you're introducing FAP to a current client, it can be a little bit confusing if your um, treatment style is very different from FAP. So this is just some of the ways to introduce FAP. So it's very much about, um, I'll be looking at ways to identify your daily life problems that comes up between us in our therapeutic relationship. Okay. And when a behavior comes up that is working really well for you, then, you know, we really want to practice this and reinforce it because that's the way we can get the most powerful change. Right. So the emphasis in a fat wrap is very much about this is our, you know, we, we are going to use our relationship in this room as kind of um, as a microscope, as a miniature world. And I get to be your guinea pig. And when you do something with me, that's really that's working out. You get to practice it here with me. And then once we get it to a point that, you know, is working for you, then you can take it outside and practice with people around you. Yeah, so that's pretty much a, a fat wrap. And all of you just have to get comfortable uh, with saying it in a way that makes sense to you and probably in your own language as well. Okay, so any questions about the fat wrap? So it's induce, introducing fat to your clients. So the, the elements are, we look at your behavior in the therapeutic relationship. We try to identify problem behaviors that show up between us and work out what would be a better way to, to, to deal with the situation, what would be the, a more helpful way to respond. We practice the help, helpful way together, and then you can take the skill outside and then practice with people around you. Okay, so that's the element, that's the element that needs to come out. So rather than me talk, you guys practice. Okay, any questions? Yes, Tian. Um... Since this is kind of a, a new this is an idea to me here, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, I get it. Yeah. But I'm sitting there trying to wrap my brain around how 
you know, all possible situations that a client may bring to you mm -hmm. that, that since our context is like that session, mm -hmm. that they've been able to target mm -hmm. all of it in session, regardless of what the issues are. And, and I'm saying that because I'm, I just did an intake on a potential client who has a history of just being in a abusive traumatic relationship, right? And so I'm trying to figure out how, how is that going to present itself in this therapeutic session when I'm being supportive and caring and not being abusive? You know, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's, I'm trying to, so I'm, I'm yeah. sure it'll happen and I'm sure it does. Yeah. I just, right now I'm struggling with conceptualizing that. So anyhow. Yeah. Well, that, that's a really great question. So um, one, what is this client wanting from the session with you? Okay. Well, we're still peeling that away. We're still kind of discovering that. So. so in a way, client goal is quite important because we want to know where they want to walk to. And if that's not clear, then, well, then there's no momentum, right? Like, where do you walk to? So in a way, SAP is very pragmatic. And, every, and I think all the treatments under the CBS umbrella are all, all about right. pragmatism. So we've got to move our body somewhere. We need to know where. So if she wants to deal with this abusive relationship, then we kind of maybe want her to start walking away from the relationship, but we don't really need to do that directly. We need to give her enough context for her to decide, ah, oh, what's actually good for me here? Gotcha. Okay. And so far she's used to an abusive context, I presume. And it's probably not all abuse because there's probably enough sugar in there for her to stay. Sure. It's addictive, right? Now, she probably doesn't know what a caring context feel like, consistency feel like, um, right. does, probably doesn't know what a nice person look like. Um, and I'd be curious, what are the parts of her that's been shut off, closed off? Right. Uh, perhaps I want to open up in session for her to discover. Yeah. And, oh, that's really interesting. I never knew I, I, I can feel this way or this, this part to me. So, okay, well, how can you how can you allow this part of you to come out more in your day to day life? And you start to almost open up the straitjacket more and more. And if she's willing to open up the straitjacket more and more, she will do the work. She'll walk right. herself out, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think what, what, what you just what I just got to is, again, you know, this behavioral model is it's about, you know, let's you know, identify a specific target, right? That's what kind of gets you there is that. And so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there has to be a lighthouse. There has to be a direction. Sure. Otherwise we get lost. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, Kelsey, can I get you to uh, randomly assign us to a room again for um, just to practice the FAP rap? Okay. So I will try to cut and paste uh, one of these things in the chat so you can have a sample and just play around with it to say, you know, try to describe FAP to each other as a therapist, okay? How much time are you giving us? Oh, very good question. Um, five minutes each way. So 10 minutes doing this. Oh, probably slightly less than that, but thereabouts. How big do you want the rooms? Like two, oh, two, two, yeah, just two. random twos. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, we're off, I think. I'll go to 12 again. Do you want to go to 11? Um, would you mind? Because I need to cut and paste stuff. No problem. Um, be... but then, um, we'll have a room of three then. Oh, okay. Well, you, you don't have to. You don't want to. You can chill. <laughs> I'll move someone then so they're not alone. Oh, thank you so much for stepping in. No problem. And actually, if you will be going into our pods, yeah, I have to sort that out in the break because I actually did all of this. I've assigned everybody and it's just not working. I don't know why. I'm going to say if you want to send me the pods, I can try and assign them. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll do that now. Once these rooms close, I'll work on. Mm, thank you.
Okay, let me never. And I hear I'm thinking I'm so organized. Um, actually, they you are. You always did this before. All right. <laughs> you have a witness. It's not you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your witness. Yay. Oh, I don't know how to send that to Maybe I can send in a chat to just you. Let's see if it comes through. Does it show up in a way that makes sense? Yes, I think it does. The... No, I'm not mango, I'm great. James, James needs to go back to his room. <laughs> <coughs> Keep popping in and out. You're like a spring, James. You can go in and out. Yeah. Can't hear you. Just to help you have a frame for the CRBs, I'm just going to introduce you to how Glenn Gallagher um, kind of created these five functional groups for interpersonal interaction. Okay, so these are functional groups um, that basically says in every relationship, these kind of behaviors, these type groups of behaviors will occur, will come up. So I, I, can you put it on the whole screen? Ah, sorry. No, thanks. There you are. So can you always see it a bit better? Okay. So don't worry about like the really technical part, but just look at assertiveness. So in a relationship, we, we have to be able to speak our needs and know what our needs are and then communicate that to another person, right? Because we're social creatures. We need to watch each other's back. We rely on each other um, as a group to survive. So assertiveness, expression of needs and boundaries are really important to stay to to get resources and to stay safe. Now, bi-directional communication is also important because we want to know that we are giving somebody attention and they are capable to give us attention and hear us too. Right? It has to be two ways. When it's only one way, um, it's like you know you keep feeding one person while you're starving. That's not going to work, and that's not going to be very effective long term. Conflict resolution, that's again another uh, inevitable part of a relationship. So when we disagree or we find out we have differences, we need to know how to bridge those differences um, in a affiliative way. So in a way that um, can repair the relationship. And intimate disclosures, that's that you've been practicing here um, lots and lots and lots because intimate disclosures are found to be the quickest way to build connection because you know we're basically showing our vulnerability. And if you have a dog, um, a dog would, um, when it trusts you enough, it will show you its belly. I think a cat too, but a cat a little bit more fickle. Um, that's their way of saying, I will let you into the most intimate part of me. And for us to show that and show our heart and to talk about really intimate things is this, well, basically has the same function. And of course, emotional expression. Emotional expression is actually really important because it allows us to be a little bit more transparent to another person. So if we can show our emotions, then it's an additional information um, to say, this situation is, is making me feel this. I am responding this way to the situation. If we can't, uh, if we can't show fear to our loved ones when we are really scared, they won't know and they won't come and rescue us. So there is a function to the signal when we show our emotions. And if we can't show joy, it would be not, you know, it wouldn't be fun because when you're doing something really pleasurable together and, and you find it really hard to smile or to laugh, um, it wouldn't, yeah, it's just, you know, just feel a little bit sad, feel a little bit lonely if you're doing something fun together. So these five functional groups um are just really useful so when you're sitting in a room uh, with anybody and with a client specifically you kind of want to check and just feel 
where are they with all these five? Do they have um, really good repertoire? Are they flexible, right? Can they dip into each of these um, systems and have the right skills or effective skills to cope with these situations? Okay, so that kind of narrows it down. So um, in the FIAT system, he, he would say, okay, this is a list of really helpful behavior and here's a list of potential CRB1s. So really it's, just, it's the opposite. So if somebody can't express their needs and can't set boundaries and uh, then basically that's a CRB1, right? And if somebody is only talking, talk, 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 talk in this kind of monologue, that's potentially CRB1. Or if you only listen and you don't talk at all and if you're always silent, um, that's a bit of a problem, okay? So does that give you a sense of, oh, now it's starting to narrow and refine what CRB ones and twos potentially can be for you. Yeah. So now in the middle is about contextual cues and discriminating discriminative stimulus function. So uh, they're quite tough words even for me to say. Basically it's about skills. Can the client actually, um, do they even know what the needs are? Do they know what situation they need to do certain things? So when you go to a fancy hotel, fancy restaurant, um, you kind of have adapt your behavior maybe, right? You can't go around farting in the hallway, what generally you don't want to in front of other people or pick your nose. And so these kind of social skills are sort of nudged into us as we grow up. And we need to know, can, how do we behave in an effective way in different contexts? So testing out our clients, knowing do they have that flexibility to operate through many different contexts? Um, also tell you what is a CRB one or two. Okay, so any questions about this? All right, so I'm kind of just dipping into um, throwing you a little bit of technicality and then we'll come back to the big group. So can I just get some feedback on, okay, is, are you starting to see contingencies? Are you starting to see CRB ones and twos? Are you starting to understand what they are about? Especially people who've never done that before. Anybody still a bit confused? Um, I, I find it hard to understand the word contingencies. Okay. Because I don't, there's nothing in Hebrew saying that. So when yeah. you say this word, it's something okay. very, very vague in my mind. All right. So all the little variables in your environment. So right now, um, you're writing something down. The fact that you can write something down. Yeah. What is in your environment? You have a now, pen. Now? Yeah. Right. It's always now. Paper. You have paper. And can you see what you're writing down? Yeah. Okay. So the light's on, right? So all these kind of little things are influencing your behavior and allowing that behavior to happen. Okay. So contingency is basically all the variables that surround you and potentially what's actually influencing could have some influence over your behavior right now. Am I correct? Kind of. So to actual behaviors out there, because I'm, I, I could know. just I could say the word in Hebrew for you at this is kluyot. Kluyot. Kluyim, kluyim, the kolmin name is tanim. Kluyot she mistavim. I love that. Does that kind of does that make sense? <laughs> I hope so. Okay, so bear in mind of time. I um, just want to quickly go through homework again. So session bridging, as I said, if you can send it back to me as soon as possible, while it's still fresh, wonderful. Wrist clock, I hope is a little bit clearer. Um, I will send a clean version in an email um, so you can have it. Now, see if you can pick a client to induce uh, the fat wrap to and see, you know, and, and start seeing you can start practicing some of the things that we're doing here and present to the group, okay, their potential CRBs. So we start picking a client and then we're slowly, slowly introducing a conceptualization um, later on in the group. 
Now, I think I've emailed you a fiat queue. I really hope so. Um, so have a look through the questionnaire and maybe fill it in to the score. This is a weird one. So the score doesn't really matter. Right. So don't worry about adding it up or whatever. What is interesting is when you fill that in, notice which CRB ones each section gets highlighted. So each section has CRB, you know, different description of behaviors. So it's really about using the fiat queue to highlight your CRB once. Okay, so complete that and then just have a look. And potentially you can introduce that to your clients as well because it help help them to see which interpersonal CRB ones pop up. And um, prepare loss of entry. I think I've sent that to you, but that won't happen until um, week four, which is in two weeks time. 100 positives is still lurking there. Um, I don't know how well you guys are doing, but plow through, keep adding. If you already have 100, fantastic. Try to challenge yourself to do more. Maybe ask other people, you know, um, what is it that you, you, you see me? What do you admire about me? Um, yeah. So maybe that's upping the challenge in bringing other people's viewpoint in about you. Okay. So does that, does the homework feel clear? I I think I've emailed everybody. So let me know if you haven't. I think some of you are not getting emails. If you're not getting emails, please check um, your junk. Um, but I will resend everything. Um, just if you're not getting emails, please email me uh, tnquay at powertolive.uk. So that's T I E N K U E I. I didn't understand what's lost in the inventory. Um, okay. It's actually attached to email. So oh. basically it's writing a list of loss events in your life. Okay. And it doesn't, it's not just about death. It's about, you know, you can lose, you can lose a relationship, um, loss an opportunity, um, losing a pet. Um, yeah. Losing something that was really dear to you. So it could loss at different levels. Okay, so the instruction is in the loss of entry. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so can you can you clarify which things we're supposed to send to you and which we're supposed to share with our pod? Okay, it's really simple. The only thing you need to send to me is the bridging form and the logs, your wrist log gets passed around your pod and that's it. Okay. Everything else you keep private because you'll be sharing that in your pod as practice. Okay, so if you have to go at half past, thank you. I think some people are already gone. Um, I will do the usual. I'll hang, I'll hang behind. I can answer questions now. So any questions, throw them at me. I was just wondering if we're to give feedback to the risk logs. Um, you can, you can. And any anyone that stand, jumps out at you, then absolutely email that person back. Um, but we will also be randomly um, assigning uh, risk log reflections next session. Okay. Any other questions? I'm just going to be here. So, bye, guys. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. I wanted to ask a question. <laughs> um, first of all, the 100 positives. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, 